Hello my darlings, it's Zui here and today I'm delivering to you the fourth chapter of my fanfiction <clears throat> Be With Me Forever. Be With Me Forever is my second attempt at delving into the fantasy AU of uh, Boku no Hero Academia and uh, so far I think it has become my uh, second most viewed uh, series not second most viewed video, but I would appreciate if you would watch this uh, series like back to back a couple of times. Um, so yeah, a lot of anticipation goes into this one. Uh, I hope you like it. It's a little long, a little extra long, a little extra large. So uh, please watch the video till the end. Like or dislike and comment something down below so I can get a better standing in the YouTube algorithm and the higher my standing in the YouTube algorithm the higher my uh, pay will be and uh, I, I, I spent a fuck ton of time writing this so please Please help a guy out Okay Let's get right into it and I hope you enjoyed just as much as I enjoyed writing it The Free Kingdoms the greatest alliance the world of Ankaria has ever seen. For the first time in recorded history, there was peace amongst the races. The proud humans of the Kingdom of Lyre and their large strongholds in the plains of Valor. The determined dwarves of the Northern Empire, ruled by their recently coronated Emperor Mineta, who still has to prove himself. The resilient orcs, human exiles and nomads of the fire tribes inhabiting the western badlands. The great elven kingdom of Sylvia, whose great tree fortress stood in the middle of the eastern black forests of Nern. And lastly, the great library of the Arcane Marium, headquarters of the archmages in the most western part of Arcaria past the Great Badlands. These five kingdoms were threatened by the power of the Great Demon Lord, whose resurrection had been foretold by the ancient king of Lyre, Toshinori Yagi, by a cult of demonologists whose leader he failed to assassinate. Time had forgotten this story, and it was believed to be a simple fairy tale. But now, this greater-than-life threat forced the free kingdoms into a desperate situation. And it forced the kingdoms to forge an alliance with one of its oldest enemies. The necromancers, who ruled over the cursed lands of the south. But an alliance with these foul mages of death had been more difficult than the kingdoms thought. The leader of the necromancers, the great Oleg, demanded his granddaughter be married to one of their leaders. With the demand that whomever they send will not offend the great one. Oleg made no further demands and left with a singular message. My lovely granddaughter will marry only a man that I approve of. She will only marry a man of the highest quality. She will only marry a man whose mere presence I can tolerate. Find me that man and I shall send you my aid. A long debate between the leaders of the kingdoms began. The kings of Lyre were already married or promised to someone else. The kings of Sylvia were too appalled by the necromancer's appearance and therefore potentially his granddaughters. And then the leader of the archmages of the Arcane Marium, the great pyromancer Enji Todoroki, who had remained silent throughout Oleg's visit, spoke up. There can be only one man sent to that wretched tower of theirs, and it has to be a man who is capable of fighting out of a tough situation should things go awry. There are only two men amongst us who have fought as a one-man army before. My son, 
Shoto, and the Red King, Bakugo Katsuki. After the words of the pyromancer echoed through the hall, the debate sparked into a new flame. Until the Red King himself volunteered. All on his own, just so that the pyromancer's son, a dear friend of his, would not have to go and suffer the potential consequences out of this deal. If Bakugo would have known that the necromancers would show him great hospitality, maybe he would have declined. You, the daughter of the formerly greatest threat to the free kingdoms, were the most beautiful woman he had ever laid eyes upon. Yet Bakugo himself has not seen the great necromancer Oleg with his own eyes. Only heard stories and tall tales. At least, until today. As soon as Bakugo awoke out of a sweet dream, he knew something was off. Loud footsteps echoed from the hallway his room was next to. After getting dressed in his royal barbarian clothes and taking a step outside, he was almost run over by a ghoul who had been carrying a heavy crate. My apologies, master, croaked the creature. We are in a hurry. Baku growled. Fine, whatever. You didn't hit me. The ghoul was about to walk past him, but the Red King took a step to the side, blocking the creature's path. What's this panic all about anyways? He barked. Uh, the master has awoken from meditation. Uh, we must feed him. Uh, we must care for him. After that explanation, he let the ghoul continue his work. Katsuki was still confused, and that confusion remained as he descended through one of the many teleportation stones the Necromancer Tower had into its grand entrance hall. There seemed to be the most buzz happening. On a crate in the middle of the hall stood you with your brother, Izar, trying to direct the flow of movement. Bakugo managed to make his way through the mass of bodies in front of him, and once he reached the crate, he shouted up to you. Yo, what the hell is going on here? You smiled upon noticing him and helped him up. Grandfather woke up from his meditation. You sighed. You were completely out of breath. So what? So what? shouted your brother before scoffing. <laughs> you clearly have read not a singular book in our library. Uh, I knew pretty boys like you are more muscle than brain. Bakugo angrily pointed a finger at the Lord Necromancer. Listen here, you Bakugo! You snapped. He's right. What? You groaned. My grandfather demands the city and the tower to be in top shape. With your arrival, I was too distracted with you. So we were lacking in a few things. Bakugo looked down from the crate. A few of the people had stopped with their work to witness the heated discussion. Cultists of the emissary somehow heard about his awakening and they have been bringing us crates filled with tributes to him. Many of the rarely traveled floors need cleaning and, well, overall we need to clean a lot in the tower. Izar now raised a finger. Oh, also you should get your cute butt back to your room. I need to get you dressed. You gave your brother the sting guy, but Bakugo was the first to open his mouth. Like hell you are! He shouted. Why would I let a slimy little worm like you get me dressed? Plus, what's wrong with the shit I'm wearing already? With his little outburst, he gained a threatening glare from both you and your brother. And the insulted Lord Necromancer swiftly kicked Bakugo off the crate. Go now, before I turn you into an automaton. The Red King was about to snap back at him, especially for the rough treatment, but the death-like gaze from you was all he needed to return to his chamber. <sighs> How do you handle him? 
Guys like this, I can only stand for a night in my lab before I make them useful to me, said your brother in a slimy tone. He is uh, much more nicer when it's only us in a room. Isar sighed with a fake smile that barely hid his annoyance. Fine then, you get him dressed. Lucky. So far you had tried every day to get Barkago to wear a tire more suited for his environment. And while the barbarian often considered it, he could never take the final step and switch his style of clothes. You replied to your brother with a simple sigh and nod. After the movement of the people, ghouls and zombies had calmed down sufficiently enough, you got off the crate. Your brother could handle the rest on his own. You gently knocked on Katsuki's door and stepped inside almost immediately, not waiting for him to invite you. He was sitting on his bed. Bakugo already had discarded his regular clothes and had put on a black necromancer robe that you had already given him many, many times already in an attempt to get him to wear it. That had been collecting dust for a few days now. His arms were crossed and he was pouting like a child. This is stupid. You sighed in resignation. The robe was at least one size too big, making him look like a toddler wearing his father's jacket. It was absolutely adorable. Why do you always insist I wear this? You sighed and sat down next to him. My grandfather has went through a lot. While he didn't create the Tower of al he was responsible for the uniting of the three creeds in a singular city. Nowhere else to this day do our kind work so well together, and it's all thanks to his rule everyone respects him. The emissaries see him as the reincarnation of their god, Spiritus Zes Plaga, and, well, when he said that Whoever gets sent and he doesn't approve of will be executed. I got scared. Not just that, I... You... You blushed. It was difficult finding the words. I care about you. Despite all the forced nature of our relationship. I, I like you and I don't want you to die. Bakugo finally understood the importance of this. Look, I, uh, I, I guess I care about you as well. M more importantly, I care about my life. You chuckled darkly. <laughs> the point is he could have woken up out of his meditation any moment and could have called for you. I, I just didn't want him to wait for you to get changed or appear before him in your, uh, uh, in your... Bakugo groaned. I get you. You don't have to say it. You sighed. You were about to stand up when he grabbed your arm. What are these three creeds anyways? You blinked, confused. Did you know nothing about your culture and necromancy before he came here? You suppressed a groan and explained. Necromancy has three primary branches that form the tree of our trade. The Doctria, the creed of magic and alchemy. The Mechanicus, the creed of science and technology. And uh, the Humanitas, the creed of the mind and soul. And technically there is Equitas, but these are necromancers who haven't decided on a creed yet, so technically it doesn't count. Uh, our robes represent which group we are affiliated with. Red, you pointed at your own robe, for Doctria. Blue for the Mechanicus, and black for Humanitas and Equitas. Bakugo looked down at himself. So what? I'm like one of these uh, Humanitas necromancers now? You shook your head. You have been given an honorary Humanitas title due to your lack of, um, well, magic capability. You don't need to be able to cast fireballs to go on a spiritual journey after all. 
You chuckled lightly. <laughs> you only need some fumes for that. Right, he replied dryly. Uh, plus, you pointed at a sigil located on the shoulder of his robes. How he didn't notice it before was a mystery to him. This is a rune of nobility. As long as you wear it, the emissary, ghouls, zombies, well, everyone, will recognize you as royalty. Bakugo humphed. Fine, I'll wear it. But only as long as Oleg is awake. You patted him on the shoulder. I'm not asking you for more. Bakugo sighed. His heart beating faster as the realization that he may not get out of this alive hit him like a dragon's tail swipe. Like a kicked puppy, he followed you outside his room to the teleportation stone. Is there anything else I need to know? Uh, where's he right now, and what should I talk about? You turned around and looked at him. He loves food, specifically meat. He organized a feast just for you and him. Avoid eating anything plant-based, unless it's required to make the food taste better, like potatoes or onions. They should be fine. And if you're lucky, vegetables and fruits won't even be on the table. Bakugu gulped. That didn't sound too bad. Do not interrupt him when he speaks. I know you like to do that. He bit his lower lip. That would be more difficult. Do not insult him, and accept any nickname he may give you. It's a strange tick of his. You thought for a moment as you stared at the teleportation zone's dial. He should be in the dining room in the pleasure baths. Not like he visits any other area of the tower these days. Bakugo furrowed his brows. Pleasure baths? <laughs> Trust me, it's much less spectacular than you think right now. The only naked skin you'll see are the statues. Bakugo inhaled sharply to suppress a chuckle. Most importantly, however, if you value his alliance and the survival of the Free Kingdoms, you gave him a serious look. Do not disagree with him when he starts talking about historic events, because most likely he has witnessed them himself. There is a reason as to why he has gotten all of his titles. Outside of the Demon Lord, he is probably the strongest being alive right now. Not counting the gods, of course. And with that, you activate the teleportation stone, sending Bakugo into the deepest pit of the Grand Necromancer Tower of Al Majik. He was surprised to find himself inside of a dimly lit hall, leading to the maw of a gigantic door. The only lights came from purple lavender-scented candles strewn about the floor. There was no decoration, just naked obsidian walls and floor. His footsteps echoed as he approached the gateway to his future grandfather-in-law. Bakugo didn't fear many things. He was the king of the barbarians after all. But the fact that there was no sound with the exception of his own breath and heartbeat and the anticipation of the encounter he was about to have gave him the same feeling he had when he first cleared out a crypt that had been infested with the undead. His outstretched hand touched the smooth wood of the door, and immediately it swung open. A gust of wind reeking of the heavy scent of both lavender and a woody incense-like aroma intruded into his nostrils, blowing out the candles behind him. The room in front of him was in stark contrast to the naked hall he had just been in. The floor was covered by a purple carpet. Towers of pillows were stacked up against the dark obsidian walls. The room was just as sparsely lit as the previous one. 
the few wall-hung torches barely sparing enough light to penetrate the encroaching darkness. A decently big dining table had been placed inside the middle of the room, but it seemed small compared to the sheer size of the room itself. Looking to his right, Bakugo saw an even bigger table pushed up against the wall. Most likely because the longer would be in hindrance to what Oleg had planned for him. <sighs> Exhaled a deep voice from somewhere behind the table. Two loud claps echoed through the room, and the unnatural darkness became less oppressive. Allowing Bakago to see what the darkness across from him had been hiding. The barbarian just barely managed to hold in a surprised shriek. Across the table sat a gigantic mass of flesh, dressed in a black robe that was beautifully decorated with golden ornaments and rubies. The upper half of the giant's face was covered by a purple veil, while the lower half revealed a large, gaping maw that was filled with razor-sharp teeth. Whatever it was, it just barely fit into its ropes, its heavy, meaty arms sticking out of the sleeves. Its fingernails were crooked and broken, as of its favorite time waste was chewing on them. But most striking of all were the many scars and stitches that were visible with just a few bits of flesh its ropes exposed. After Bakugo managed to work through his initial horror, the creature leaned back in its throne, folding its hands over its massive belly. <sighs> it repeated the noise. You must be Bakugo. It tilted his head to the side. How this thing didn't implode on its own weight. Defiled all logic. After another minute of silence, it pointed at the chair at the opposite end of the table. He followed the order. Despite the giant's grotesque appearance and appalling lavender smell, it exhumed an aura of authority that was entirely alien to Bakugo. He felt as if any request from the mouth of this creature would need to be answered with a yes or suffer the greatest of consequences. This was the abominable image of the great Lord Necromancer Oleg, the tyrant of al -Majik, the man who had grown fat from strength, the beast of Nern, the most powerful necromancer to ever exist, the enemy of all living things, Oleg the Corpse Maker, son of Orson, the Lord of Zombies, and son of Sophia, renderer of flesh, and the only human to ever suppress the age of 150 years. The fact that this man still classified as a human was a scary thought to the Red King. My lovely grandchildren have spoken highly of you. The Red King, Bakugo Katsuki, leader of the barbarians, slayer of dragons, king of the fire tribes, said Oleg. I have great expectations of you. Expectations I'm sure you will live up to. Every time the necromancer moved a muscle, it was accompanied by the sound of cracking bones and the stretching of sinewy skin. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. My dearest grandson told me you avoided our libraries. The man shook his head. Do not be afraid. I understand that books are not always the preferred method of passing knowledge for the barbarians. A toothy grin spread across the necromancer's face. How about this, Master Bakugo? You will ask me a question that I ask for myself. And we keep doing this until both of us are satisfied. 
Malkogo's heart felt as if it was jumping out of his throat. But he needed to stay calm. If he were to panic, this would be it. He needed to humanize the man in front of him if he was to ever feel calm enough to speak normally. Uh, your granddaughter has spoken of you. Uh, your granddaughter spoke of you having meditated. Uh, why was that? Uh, the creed of humanity just demands of a person to be of clear mind. I'm sure my granddaughter told you of the three creeds. Thank the heavens you just did. With a sigh of relief, Bakugo answered. <laughs> yes. Good. Good. Oleg's shoulders quivered with excitement. Clarity control, as it is called, is the most important virtue of my kind. With it, we can deep into the abyss in hopes of realizations, ideas, and communing with our dead. This seemed similar to the spirit walking the shamans of the fire tribes did, thought Bakugo. My turn. Oleg thought for a moment, before moving into an upright position in his chair, his large arms now resting on the table. Do the fire tribes still battle in gladiatory combat? Oh, I miss watching them. Bakugo nodded. Uh, yeah, yeah, in fact, before I came I attended an event. A prisoner sentenced to death managed to fight off a minotaur with just one singular bronze gladius. The giant clapped his massive hands enthusiastically. <laughs> oh, I can see it in front of my inner eye. Beautiful carnage. Ghouls entered the hall, delivering large plates of food. As expected, large quantities of various means. Bakugo's eyes shifted upwards. Oleg took an entire chicken drumstick and crushed it inside of his gaping mouth, including the bones. Despite that, he managed not to spill a single drop of fat or sauce on his robes. Taking a break from his ceaseless gluttony, Oleg spoke up again. I believe it is your turn to ask me a question. Bakugo audibly swallowed the piece of meat in his mouth. Your granddaughter spoke of you being well-traveled. How far did you get around? A laugh more akin to the rutting call of a large animal erupted from the man. <laughs> I have traveled many regions of Ankaria, my boy. I have traveled many regions of Ankaria, my boy. From the eastern shores all the way to the Arcanumarium in the west. Now Baku's interest was awoken. So, you've met the fire tribes? I mean, you know of the gladiator battles. But Oleg only answered with another question. How closely niche are the bonds of the Fire Tribes with the Kingdom of Sylvia? For a moment, Bakugo was taken aback. But then he remembered the little game the necromancer was playing. Suppressing an annoyed sigh, Bakugo answered. They recently established very well guarded trade routes directly to the stronghold. The orcs were upset since it allowed the elves to freely travel through their territories without permission, but it could be worse. The stronghold was a large city made of hundreds of tents, surrounded by a protective wall made from dragon bones. It was considered the capital of the fire tribes. Oleg simply replied with a wide grin, refraining from any comments until he finished an entire cooked chicken in just three bites. About your question. Have I ever met the fire tribes? Uh, yes, I have. In fact, 
the nomadic shamans were my initial inspiration to join the Humanitas Creed, which to this day I consider one of the best choices I ever made. Bakugo smiled. After your dismissive remarks about barbarians and Izar's blatant superiority complex, it was nice hearing something positive about his people. The friendly banter with the monstrous human continued, until Oleg asked a single question. Did the people of Sylvia marry any of their daughters to the kings of Lyre yet? Bakugo thought for a moment. Princess Amelia of House Moon married Crown Prince Zero. The construction of his fortress hasn't been finished yet, so uh, he's technically not a king yet. So it has begun, thought the giant to himself. Even though Bakugo could see very little of Oleg's face, he could see that these news brought him certain distress. Is something wrong, my leash? Oleg raised his right hand. Do you understand the long-term consequences of fornicating with the other races? Bakugo was taken aback. He didn't fully understand what the necromancer meant. Let's be starved with this. The giant took a sip of wine from a chalice that stood right next to his plate. What is the vague goal of necromancy? Bakugo shrugged. Huh? Science? Uh, understanding of death? Oleg blinked in confusion but Baku not been able to see his eyes. He had hoped the barbarian was smarter than that. It's humans, my boy, started Oleg. Humans are frail species when it comes to our physical strength. Our magical capabilities are average at best. We require our science and imagination to survive in the wilderness. But what is the great divider of our species with the others? Oleg went silent, letting Vago think. I can only guess, said the barbarian. But I'd say our readiness to forget ethics if it means survival? Oleg chuckled. <laughs> you just said that to make yourself look smarter than you actually are, my boy. No. While there is truth in it, our brutality is far removed from that of the marauding orcs of old, when they were still allied with the demons. No, no. It's our lifespans. Bakugos widened, and he audibly gulped. He genuinely didn't thought of that. A human is not receiving extensive... A human. If not receiving extensive surgery, magical treatments, spiritual guidance, and artificial organs crafted from only the finest materials available, die at best as early as 70 years compared to that of a dwarf, for example. Oleg paused for a moment to shove a large piece of meat into his gut before continuing. A dwarf lives on... A dwarf's life can be as short as a hundred years, while they've been spared the life of a low ground worker to a hundred years. In fact, the father of the current dwarven emperor managed to reach 255 years. Bakugu could tell Oleg was about to go on a long tangent, so he took a more comfortable sitting position. An orc's life it's roughly a hundred years at best, so there's no large difference there, but... But then, there are these... The necromancer's hands turned to fists. These nature-loving, tree-hugging pests, whose natural lifespan, if not interfered by illness or murder, live up to a thousand years. The sudden change in tone of both Oleg and the conversation unnerved the Red King. The only reason their numbers haven't exploded yet 
It's because they breed for necessity rather than lust, fun, and tradition. The giant slammed the table hard enough to leave a dent. Elves have been the natural enemy of necromancers for thousands of years, which for us is a lot. But for them, at worst, two or three generations. Bakugo felt intimidated as if Oleg was about to jump at him and eat him whole. But he needed to say something. Anything, really. Why? was the barbarian's only question. There are many factors. The ancient necromancers of old, the exiles of the Arcadamarium, lived in fear of prosecution. So they kept their arts hidden. But it was always our goal to even out the playing field between us and these almost immortal beings. Compared to them, we are nothing but rats or cockroaches feeding off of their scraps. Oleg took a more threatening stance as he continued. Humans and dwarfs are closely related. Before the recordings of history, our two races joined forces, but eventually, humanity understood that they were more than just a tall dwarf. And eventually, they formed their own communities, their own kingdom. And one of these ancient cities was the metropolis of Elsinore. A port city, connected to both the ocean and a large river. It quickly became the capital of the first human kingdom, the Griffin Empire. However, the ancient humans had expanded too fast, and too late they realized that we built Elsinore close to a sacred forest of these... Oleg spit on the ground. Elves. Tensions rose. We were cutting down the useless trees for our growing industry, and they really didn't like that. And so the first war between humans and another species began. Bakugo furrowed his brows. Yes, but why have I never heard of this city, this war, before? Oleg chuckled darkly. <laughs> Because they cleaned from their history books. Because they cleaned it from the history books. The humans of old pushed harshly back against the green hell. Nature had cursed us with feeble bodies, and we were striking back against it for the first time. But then, humans did what humans do best. Bakugo almost didn't dare to ask. And, uh, that would be... Women, my boy. Elven women. Beautiful compared to a human. An elven woman is a goddess. A living painting. Their beauty revered far and wide. When our ancestors raided their villages and towns, they slaughtered the men and took their women and children. Which was the greatest mistake we could have made. For one of these elven families was sold to a brothel in Alshador slums. The mother and daughter were subject to the worst kinds of torture you can imagine, and probably more. The problem with this was the fact that elves and humans actually can create offspring with one another. Soon for them, but many years for us, the brothel's employees were replaced by the children of the elven girl. She acquired riches from work, degrading herself in front of her patrons, only to slit draggers across throats, scheming with politicians and corrupting nobility. And any of the seafaring visitors, and why wouldn't they? For what they believed, they just had gotten access to eternal beauty and submissive women. All of this amounted to the massacre of Elsinore, where one night the little whore ordered her grotesque family clan to murder every single human in sight. By then she had become the queen over Elsinore, so for a time no one knew it happened. 
the streets red red with blood and screams of the dying people. Our people. A crime unwitnessed by the masses. The more Oleg was talking, the redder his face became, as of both the disgust with his ancestors about their tragic mistake and the humiliation he felt from the loss were taken over his body and mind. The first Lord Necromancer, Zoltan, had his daughter stationed in Elsinore as a student for the elemental arts. She did not survive the massacre. And she was furious. He immediately summoned forth an army. It was the first time the three creeds of necromancy worked together. However, by the time our troops gathered in front of Elsinore's gates, they had called for the help of the Sanctuary, the ancient elven kingdom that now has been remained to Sylvia. Oleg's entire body shook with hatred. After that little wretched child! And so began the first necromancer war. The undead pushed past into the elven heartlands. Since they were dead, there was not spared a singular soul to be bred, to bring the cursed brood into the world. No human man fulfilled their needs, birthing a creature born in scorn and hatred. But Zoltan, blinded by hatred and determination, kept pushing and pushing, and forwent strategy. And that was the downfall. That is why the necromancers lost the war. And about this time, the history books pick up. The one that you most certainly read or heard about. I have the law of the Free Kingdoms. Now according to them, we needlessly slaughtered into their lands until we were valiantly defeated, driven back into the south to where we remain to this day. But. But. The necromancer raised a finger. We have not forgotten. We will not stop until we humans are on equal grounds with the other races. We will not be replaced by these undying abominations of nature by breeding with them of our own kin. No, we will wipe them out before I let that happen. As long as I live, I promise they will not replace us. Something clicked inside Bakugo. Of course, he didn't agree with the old man. This cycle of violence committed had to end at some point after all. But he finally understood the thought process of Izar, Oleg, and the rest of your kind. You weren't evil warmongers who ate children like the Free Kingdoms were saying in their books. You were simply convinced of a future and where humans were extinct by their own choice of lust and laziness. But the way it manifested would certainly lead to something that was just as evil. Oleg, this sounds like genocide to me. Oleg scoffed. <laughs> it's not genocide, my boy. It's pesticide. And it has already begun. The kings of Lyre are wedding into elven families. They will integrate into Lyre, and humans will prefer fornicating with triangle eared forest dwellers. And soon there will be no more humans in Lyre. Bakugo could practically feel the fear radiating off of the giant. Was this why he meditated so much? The barbarian wished he could convince the old necromancer that this paranoia was a bit far-fetched. But someone like him would always come up with an excuse to support his own biases. If anything, he pitied the creature in front of him. The tyrant of al Majik was nothing more but an animal that believed itself to be cornered. And maybe... 
That's why he was so specific when he first called for a husband to be wed to you. Bakugo, my boy, said Oleg. You certainly had been an entertaining evening. And you're surprisingly good at listening. You have my blessing to marry my granddaughter. Just please promise me. You will give me grandchildren before I will finally pass away. Without saying another word, Bakugo stood up from his chair and respectfully bowed before your family's patriarch. I am honored, he said in a hushed tone, and Oleg smiled before leaning back in his chair. Let's finish our beer, boy. And then, you're free to do whatever you want.